so we should have some folks joining in. I just shared the event. Um, today we're talking about the road to CT certification. Um, but before we go too deep into our topic, Kim, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Kim Mankiewicz. I've been teaching at Oxford High School for close to 20 years. <laughs> hate to say that out loud, but about 20 years. I started out in Milan High School. I taught computer programming there, and I was hired into Oxford several years ago as a computer science teacher, um, but it wasn't the traditional computer science program, and things kind of shifted and funding and everything like that, so I kind of sat and I taught math for several years. And then I took a leap and switched over to English, which is definitely um, interesting. Seventh grade English, I love it. Um, seventh grade math. And then there became a position available called a CTE computer science teacher. And I didn't know anything about the CTE world. So now I have been teaching computer science at Oxford High School for two years. Um, COVID-1 and COVID-2. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Definitely been an interesting experience, but I'm absolutely enjoying teaching the computer science programs. Um, we're building the program. So last year we taught, um, I say we, but I taught um, programming and gaming where we started the kids with Snap and then moved into Python. And then we revamped the class a little bit so that this year I'm using code.org's program to teach computer science principles. And then I also taught the AP Computer Science A, the Java course. And then I teach a middle school, pro, uh, the SNAP program at the middle school. And then next year, we will be expanding to that program. And we'll get into Python, programming and gaming, and then web design. So we're building the program and working on expanding that. And that's all in the CTE for so um, for those people that don't understand that's career and technical education. So that's um, kind of a subset, and we focus on career skills. So I don't know if you want me to dive into that now or go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'd love to understand more about. Um, well, first of all, as you touch on it, like what is CTE, um, and how is it? relevant to teaching computer science um, and, and then maybe we can learn more about how your role looks on a um, sort of more, more concrete basis being a CTE teacher. Sure. So what we follow, um, CTE teachers, they are given a gap analysis from the state. So each state has something different. And I will be completely 100% honest that I would not survive without my director. Um, Lisa Butts is an amazing person. And she basically is superwoman to all of us in the CTE department. So anything that we are missing as far as the logistics go, she's our go-to woman. Um, so I handle the teaching and she handles a lot of the logistics, but being in the CTE realm, we have what's called a gap analysis. And if you've, um, you, we'll get into the advisory later, but if you remember in our advisory meeting, we talked about that. Um, and that covers, um, and each, each area of career technical education will cover um, their own gap analysis. So we have classes that are in auto, uh, we have business finance, we have digital imaging, we have robotics, um, mechatronics, um, health science, and those are career skills. And the idea is, is that not every child is going to go into college. Some of them are going to go into trades. And we focus on trying to give them as many certifications as possible in their high school career. So um, we have the gap analysis, which says what they need, which skills that they need to obtain. And I should have pulled that up. But one of them would be, do you know how to send an email? Do you know how to have a job interview? Do you know how to write a resume? And so we focus on a lot of the career skills that I would not necessarily teach in a math classroom or in an English classroom. Um, and we give them that training that they need to be ready. So if they leave high school, they have that potential to get hired instantly. And 
Um, I'm curious if you have data on uh, your students, like what percent um, choose to um, may pursue uh, like a, a two-year degree, a four-year degree, or, or just go into working in some kind of computer science related field? So we're building that data, but another thing, see, this is why I'm trying to remember everything as we go, but in CTE, the state actually has us call every single student that was a graduate in our program, we call them the following year and we see how they have um, proceeded. Did they go to college? Did they go to trade school? Are they working? And we ask those questions and that's one of the requirements that we have to do um, in, in regards to CTE. Mm -hmm. so. And this year, and I don't yeah. have the data yet because this is my second year. Um, I know I have a couple students that last year, they're, they've gone off to college. I've had a few students that are just kind of staying at home right now and doing side jobs and stuff like that. But unfortunately, I don't have the data for that yet, but I know that there is data out there at the state level. Um, and I, I believe, again, these are the questions my director would have. She'd be able to pull it up right away. Um, I personally don't have that, but I know it's out there. And that's one of the things. The state is all about tracking data. We actually have to submit what's called a SIP self-review. Every year we submit that and we have to document everything we've done um, as far as what work-based learning, and I know we're going to transition over to that soon, so work-based learning, what have we provided the students? Um, you are aware that I had students interview professionals, and so in the process of interviewing professionals, that counts as a work-based learning experience. So they got that exposure to see, hey, is this something I want to do? And if it's not, that's okay. It's better sometimes to know what you don't want to do than to necessarily know what you want to do, especially if there's ninth graders, 10th graders, they may not know what they want to do. So, and then the other things with the um, gap uh, the SIP self-review, we report who got certified, what certifications students received. Um, it's actually a very, lengthy process that usually takes us at least a full day um, to complete that and then we're still working on it but we you we do that throughout the entire school year gotcha you raised a couple interesting points there uh the, the first one about certification yeah. um what does that look like for computer science well um so this year i taught um the principals class and my students had the opportunity to take the AP exam not all of them did but they had that opportunity so there's that and then there's also we had um, that we partnered with precision and every student in my class took an intro to programming certification and they could have passed that um, which was kind of nice and that um, gives them skills that they need for you know, I think it was you in one of the conversations we had. Sometimes the certifications are helpful and sometimes the certifications can be just, you know, on paper and say, um, you know, I guess it gives the kids a sense of pride too. Hey, I passed an exam and I know this material. Um, we've talked to the kids a lot of time. They're like, hey, I know Java. Why? Because I can play Minecraft, I know Java. Well, no, you need to prove that you know it. Um, and so my AP kids, the CSA, the Java kids, I had them take the my MTA exam, which is a Microsoft Technology um, Associate, I think it is. And they took that and the, um, several of them passed that. They also had the opportunity to take the AP um, College Board exam. And then I have a few kids, there's about three of them that are going to be taking the OCA exam. Um, and it gives them an opportunity to get those certifications, you know, that if you think about it, when you sit down to make a resume as a high school student, what do you have to put on it? There's not a lot. But if you have these certifications, wow, you look a little bit more presentable to somebody, especially if you want to just jump out of high school and go into a career. So, mm -hmm. Certainly. 
I think when we had that conversation, now sort of looking back on it, I think I might have had a different opinion because I was thinking from a from a really different perspective. I think my my context was really different. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's interesting to think about like people leaving a um, high school intro CS class um, you know, with some kind of certification or, or something, and 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 trying to get hired. <laughs> I'd be interested to see like what kinds of opportunities exist for them and and how they're able even to like, an break intern, into the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even an internship. Um, one of the things that they need is that experience. And what I'm hoping to eventually get to is as I build this program, the last year would be go and do an internship at a company and work with them so that you get that experience under your belt. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know that when you go for a job, they're going to ask, well, what experience do you have doing this career? Um, I know my husband's a computer programmer and okay, well, how are you, can you do programming if you don't have any experience? So sometimes just having that extra experience is, is gold. <laughs> it really is. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so if that can help people get their like, first internship or what, whatever that might be, I think that's really logical. And so I think at that point where you just kind of look at the success rate and <laughs> the cost and evaluate from there, right? Yeah. I mean, I the kids really a, like mm -hmm. it too. Yeah, it's a good motivator. They need that self-esteem boost too. Like, oh my goodness, I have this accolade. I I did this. You know, mm -hmm. I worked hard for this. I have a paper that says, yes, I know this, and I passed. Or, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's definitely. I mean, even just sort of thinking back to myself, I think I would have appreciated something like that. Um, how do you fit that in with teaching AP? Well, um, the AP exam, if we, it's a juggle, <laughs> but the AP exam for the computer science A, the Java, that exam was, I think, May 7th. So my students that um, were taking the AP exam, I was able to give them the MTA exam and I gave it to them as like a, a prep for their AP, for the college board exam. So that was kind of exciting, like, okay, well, you gotta study for this and here's your certification exam before your college board exam, um, which I probably should have done it differently, <laughs> but <laughs> hindsight's always twenty twenty. And then the kids that passed the MTA exam, um, we were able to get the opportunity for them to get the, to sign up to take the OCA exam. And one of those is, um, and I think we had talked about this earlier, with the funding. That's not something that we necessarily would have been able to afford if we were on a standard budget. We were able to use some CTE funds to cover the cost. Um, so that was that was kind of nice because some of these kids, they don't necessarily have the funds to pay for some of these certifications on their own. and. I think kids are more likely to take a certification in class if it's offered to them than to say, you know what, I have an interest in this and I'm going to go try it on my own and pay for a certification. So um, having it embedded in a classroom truly makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these aren't, I mean, I, I don't know about MTA, but o OCA, you're, you mean the Oracle Java certification, right? Yeah, yes, and I know your feelings on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's also expensive, right? I mean, like these yeah, aren't things generally. No, 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 no. This was a, just um, to see if the kids, I only have three kids doing that. So it's not that expensive. I mean, it is expensive um, and they have mm -hmm. different levels. There's the junior certificate and then there's the OCA and the OCP. So we do have different options that are available, but we're just trying something this year to see how it goes. And, you know, in the future, a kid, if I say, hey, if you're already prepared for it, if you've gotten the sort of, you know, the preparation, then they might take it on their own. So, and who knows, I might work with, you know, hey, let's see if we can get a scholarship for somebody. Would you scholarship a kid? How many businesses would love to, you know, they some businesses throw money all the time at, let's give a kid an opportunity to pass 
um, a certification exam. That's kind of where I'm thinking of going with this. But again, just starting out, two years into this, I got a lot of ideas. I just need to put them into action. So, Awesome, awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about certification um, and your role as a, a CT uh, computer science teacher. Um, I'm curious to know um, what your responsibilities and expectations are from you know, the school, the state, and how that's different from being just a, uh, say just in, not in a sort of diminutive um, sense, but just as in a more narrower scope of being a computer science teacher. So if I were um, a traditional educator, and I'll use a different subject just for my brain to function around that. If I'm teaching math or if I'm teaching English, I'm going to go in, I'm going to be observed by my um, principals, and then I'm going to, um, you know, I'll get observed and I'll do a student learning objective and I'll show growth and I'll have a few observations through the year. As a CTE teacher, I'm also getting that, but at the state level, I'm required to do two advisory meetings. Um, the first one being in like first semester, the second one in the second semester, and I can come back to advisory. But then I also have um, the gap analysis that I have to follow. Those are the standards. And I have to rank them. How well did I cover them? As a, as a teacher, they're not going to ask me, okay, did you cover um, commonly misused phrases or um, I can't, you know, like dangling modifiers or something like that. Have you gone through and covered everything and what level did you cover them? Well, you're going to have tests and quizzes that will show you what the students did. But in the CTE realm, you have to physically report out what you provided every single student. What opportunities did you give them? How many certifications were earned? How many did you offer? How many work-based learning experiences did you offer? Who attended those? Um, there's a lot more accountability in the CTE realm. They, it has its perks, but it's also you're held accountable to a different standard. And there's more um, checking of boxes, per se, that is required in order to do CTE versus, um, you know, like, Last year is a prime example. We were shut down with COVID. In the English department, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be able to, to get through this unit. Um, I'll just make some adjustments in my curriculum and move on. But in the CTE realm, no, you have to get through these segments. How are you going to get through these segments? Well, I'm going to get guest presenters and we're going to do a lot of these mini lessons or lectures and a Zoom call to cover as many of them as possible. It's, it's different and there's no, um, yes, we could put that we couldn't cover some of them because of COVID, but you're still held to a different standard, I guess is the best way to explain it. And then if you can't cover something, you had to justify why you weren't able to cover that. I see, gotcha. Um, and I'm interested to know uh, what, what, what drew you to becoming a CT teacher. And maybe if you could just briefly sort of outline what it looks like to um, become a CT teacher sort of without the specifics or what resources people could go to to learn more about that. Um, so you can go to the michigan.gov for our state, but you can go and look at CTE requirements. Now what you need, um, so I came in on a different lens. I came in as, as a certified teacher transitioning to computer science um, as a computer science teacher. There are also people that are industry certified. So if you are a computer programmer by trade and you decide, you know what, I wanna go into teaching, you have that ability in that CTE realm to shift over to that. Now the logistics and the technicality, you're gonna kind of have to go through um, Lisa because she's the guru on that. But as far as 
when I went for that, um, so one, why did I go for that? I'm a computer science major. My master's is in educational technology. I'm a nerd. I love this stuff. Um, I have rubber ducks on my desk, and if you don't know anything about that, then you're not a computer science geek. Um, we curse at commas and, I mean, semicolons and, you know, that's just our world. I love it. I, I'm, I really enjoy solving puzzles. And when I was approached that, hey, we have a position in the CTE realm, I didn't know what I was up against. I really didn't. I really thought it was just, oh, I'm going to teach computer science. This is awesome. I'm excited. And now we're going to throw the CTE part on it. Well, I don't know what this is. But um, Lisa took me under her wing, showed me, and I'm just seeing all the benefits it provides the kids. I, what is it something I would have jumped into knowing that it was CTE in the beginning? It probably would have scared me away. But <laughs> um, it's very rewarding. I absolutely love it. Um, and all I needed to do before I was able to get that CTE certification was to come up with hours where I have had industry experience. So on the side, um, I do, you know, I've worked with web design and I've done, um, my husband owns his own business. So I've helped out with that as far as marketing. And um, I've, you know, worked on taking some Java certification. I have my Java certification and I've done a lot of things and I had to document how I have hours of experience in order to do this. Now, if I was coming in off of industry, some of you guys, easy, 40 hours a week, I got this. And then you can, you you have that accreditation or requirement. Um, somebody coming from teaching, it was a little bit more challenging me to find those hours. Um, I was given 10 years to put together those hours. I think it was 4,000 hours in 10 years, which, may sound like not a lot but when you're working full-time as a teacher and then it's additional to what you're doing then it becomes a challenge but you're also needing to continue that education um so i continue to do anywhere i can get experience um because it's not one and done okay i turned in my certification i don't have any more to do no especially in this field of computer science and all these careers, there's something changing. And that's why I have a lot of the, um, you know, professionals. That's one of the things we talked about in the beginning. I can't keep up with all the, ch the changes going on. And that's why I've invested in, you know, having professionals. We talked about the advisory committee in the beginning. Um, the advisory committee is made up of professionals and asking for your input and advice as to how to form this program and what what do kids need? What do they need to be successful? That's a really interesting point on the um, advisory committee. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well. Um, what, what is that? Is that a requirement? Is that um, yep. something you chose to do on your own? No. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, we have it twice a year. So we typically do the first one, I think, in October. And then the second one is usually April 15th. And we collaborate and we talk to professionals and we tell them what we have covered. There's a whole format that we follow. There's a meeting minutes and agendas. We have a chairperson and I tell you, hey, this is what I've done the past year. This is what I'm planning on doing next year. Do you have any guidelines? Do you have any suggestions? Um, you know, one of the suggestions was they um, in my specific advisory, they didn't like the name of the programming and gaming. Maybe we should make rename it to game design. Or, hey guys, I need to talk about web design. I'm teaching web design next year. What should I do? Should I work on WordPress? WordPress? Should I do Wix? Should I do HTML? Should I do CSS? Should I do a notepad? Should I? Where, what do I do? You know, um, we don't have an FTP anymore, so. <laughs> um, you know, we don't have Dreamweaver or whatever it was back in the day. And, you know, there's other programs, but I haven't been in that realm. So that's where they can offer advice. Um, and, you know, like Java is constantly changing. There's a Java 11 out there. 
okay, well, what makes Java 8 different than Java 11? I've been teaching Java 8. What's going, wait, what, what's going on? Can you give me, oh, it just adds this. And that's where it's so helpful to have those connections. It really is. And then, well, wait, I need some technology for my room. What should I purchase? Well, you need this. Well, I need dual monitors. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm sitting here with one computer with my, what I need to do, and then the other one with my code, um, which your coding rooms, by the way, <laughs> is very helpful as the kids are needing, you know, the extra help with coding. I can, it's actually really cool how I can just type on their line and say, okay, this is what you need to do instead of, yeah, it can be a mess without it. So, um, but back to advisory, sorry. <laughs> There's your plug in there. Um, but the advisory is phenomenal. Um, just having that connection and like I connected with, so my kids right now, um, this week are working on interviewing professionals. And I start with my advisory committee. Who wants to help me interview profession? Like who wants to help have a stu interview students so that they get that interview experience? And they volunteer for me. Um, and then they're, they're also able to start into what's called the TEALS program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I got hooked up with them and they are run by Microsoft and they bring volunteers to me, which is nice because um, I need that work-based learning. And so they were able to provide that naturally by volunteering in my classroom a couple times a week. So. I think I answered everything. I probably forgot something, but <laughs> you'll no, tell me if I didn't. Yeah, a pretty, pretty, okay. um, pretty ex exhaustive answer. Um, Teals sounds really exciting, and the whole um, involvement of professionals in general, I think, is really exciting. Um, and especially to the extent that it can fill some of the gaps in AP. You know, I mean, it, and, and I know you, you don't only teach AP, but I, I sort of. So it's more standard and uh, I'm a little more familiar with, with um, what's taught. It, it, it does. It really does fill those gaps because what will happen, um, you know, I'm teaching it. And this year I learned Java as I was teaching it. And I would understand, okay, this is a class. This is, you know, how we write everything. And this is how it's going to be defined. Well, is it always this way? Well, it's always this way for this unit. Okay, hey, volunteer, um, help me out. What's the answer here? Because I can do the then and now, but I don't necessarily have all those skills to understand what's beyond that. Some of the questions the kids will come up with are just, they're lifelong learners. They want these questions, and I may not have all those higher end thinking questions because I haven't lived that day in and day out. I'm learning like one of the kids sometimes, <laughs> you know. Sometimes the kids are faster than me, and that's okay, and I'll admit it. <laughs> but um, yeah, they and definitely so help. How and, and and in what ways do they help? I mean, you mentioned they they sort of uh, come to the classroom a couple times a week. What, what does that actually look like? Well, it depends on the class. So um, sometimes it's extra hands on deck when kids are debugging. Uh, the first time I started debugging programs. I'd sit there and look at it for hours and hours and hours and say, okay, I don't know what's going on with this. What is going on? And then a volunteer would come by, oh, they just forgot this. In like two seconds, just that having that expertise. Now, I'm getting better. Um, as I've been doing more and more debugging, I've gotten my time a lot <laughs> down. Um, but that's huge, having that help. Uh, having the help with the additional, like the higher level questions, but also, when am I going to use this? I don't have to worry about that. They're going to give that experience and that, you know, that scenario. Um, we talked about the Eclipse. I use Replit. I've used Eclipse. And then, you know, one of my volunteers is like, well, have you shown them IntelliJ? Well, I don't even know what IntelliJ is. So you show them. And they have some of the, you know, ins and outs of those you know, the IDEs that I never would have even thought to experiment with. Um, or here, you know, I'm trying to go through the IDE and maybe I haven't used it myself. How do I start this? And so they may be even teaching me so that I can teach in the future. The plan with Teals is they want to give you that, I guess, comfort and confidence 
to be able to teach this on your own. And um, yes, I have a computer science degree. I took C++ in college, but that was ages ago. And I had been so far for, removed for computer science for a while, I had to relearn a lot of things. And um, they were there alongside me, helping me. But also, uh, like the principles class, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. There's a lot of scenarios. I had some, um, we talked, we had cybersecurity, and I had some people from the bank come in and share and um, do a phishing experiment with the kids. And um, just some of the, ins you know, talking about Alexa and how to change the settings of that just is something that they have. Okay, here's the reality. IT is huge what do you do i'm it okay which area of it there's so many things and i cannot be a master of them all so hey you're gonna help me with this area you're gonna help me with this area you're gonna help me with this area please 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 because i can't do it on my own and so they are the master they are the expert in that area and I rely on them. So then I can handle getting coordinating of, hey, you guys come in and teach this for me because it's changing. You know, I may learn it and then, oh wait, they came out with this new software. Oh crap. I mean, if you have an iPhone, you know how many times they update their software. So I can't keep up with that. What's the latest version? What's the latest, you know, I just need their help. <laughs> so if anybody wants to volunteer, I'd love more volunteers. But anyway <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm sure you have well it, clearly you have no problem um not, 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 to, not to say that it's easy but yeah. but th there are sort of plenty of people in industry and, and sort of um, around the industry that are um, looking for opportunities right to to be able to give back some of their time um and it sounds like programs like teals are really helpful do you do you think that you know, as you gain more experience you would continue to use teals or you'd say oh um like I, I know what I'm doing now, um, and so um, now I'm just focused think, sort of on my own teaching. I think um, whether I use Teals or not, Teals is great, and having them in the classroom on a regular basis is phenomenal. I love that, um, and I hate to say whether I would use them or not. Next year, I've already signed up to use them again, and I love them, and I love that they have that continuous volunteers. But I'm also building my advisory, you know, my advisory group and able to expand that. So, you know what, maybe who can't devote two times a week? That's a lot for somebody that may not have that extra free time. Hey, can you come in and just be a guest speaker for one day? That may be something more manageable for them. I had 50 students who um, had interviews and I partnered them up for them to interview a professional that's 25 professionals that's a lot now these kids are getting interviewed all 50 of these kids are having a professional interview them um, so that takes time and I think if it were one or two people that would be exhausting so the more I have in my pool of people it makes it easier for everybody so um, just expanding on that is huge gotcha gotcha um, so coming back to, um, sort of ha having professionals in the classroom and, and how that, um, affects your curriculum, um, you know, there, there's definitely this sort of, sort of argument that, um, computer science should be around learning how to think logically, um, learning how to solve problems, understanding, um, more fundamental aspects of, uh, programming uh, and, and, and computer science as opposed to learning how to code in Java or like how to build WordPress sites. And so one thing I'm interested to know more about is how you actually balance these sort of competing, um, competing objectives, right? That's what the gap analysis is. That's okay. this, um, I wish I, you know, had it open and, you know, I could screen share it with you, but it's basically, I think, six pages of the spreadsheet of what I need to cover. And so you map it out and you say, okay, I'm going to focus on these concepts first semester and I'm going to focus on these concepts second semester and I'm going to crank through and you're just going to do your ba best to balance. Um, some of them, 
so I wouldn't say that the entire class is programming. So we have the intro level. So that's my computer science principles, and we call that the segment class. That's going to cover the, as you would call, the fundamentals of computer science. Then we have what's called a Q course. So it will build upon that. So let's get the basics of IT in general. See what you're interested in. And then if you're interested in programming, okay, let's go up in the next level of programming. So I have the, you know, the programming and gaming, the web design, and the Java. So not everybody has to be a programmer. There are so many areas. I have several students right now that are so excited about cybersecurity. And um, some of them are like, oh, I like Linux, or I, I just want to do computer hardware. Okay, that's awesome. So let's go through, and they interviewed with a professional, and that professional provides them that advice on what they need to do next. I can't say I'm a master of every single area. If you want to go into, oh, data scientists, or um, there were some things that I didn't even know existed in the IT world, by the way. And so those kids were able to, I gave them an opportunity to explore different areas of computer science. There's, um, we use things like NEPRIS where they can go in and look and see different jobs that exist in the IT realm and explore. And then from that, they picked an area that interests them and they started to do um, interviews. In the future, I would love to do more of that. Um, just so that they can get those fundamentals and go with whomever, you know, maybe they liked one area, but they want to try another. This year was my first year doing this activity, and I think it was very beneficial, but I almost feel like I should do one per quarter so that they get more exposure and more opportunity to see what they like or what they don't like. I see. Um, and then maybe, maybe to tie all this back, so um, wondering sort of how to frame this. I, I guess um, let, let, let's sort of imagine your, um, your, your, your students, uh, the, the ones who are sort of interested in, in, in um, let's say, IT-related stuff. They, they basically kind of have two tracks, right? There's sort of the further education, you know, the higher ed track or the career track. Um, and I'm interested to know what what you think the curriculum and um, the school maybe and, and, and sort of the, 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 the course in general, like what things do you think would be beneficial um, to fill the gap for what those two audiences need? So um, for example, if you're looking to send more people into industry, what do you think they're missing? Like, what, what are you hearing in terms of, oh, I went out and I, I wish I had learned this in my uh, comp sci class. So uh, it's uh, interesting that you say that. So when we were talking about the inter the, okay, so at the end of the year, um, sorry, at the start of the year, we call back all the seniors that had graduated the previous year and find out if they're in career, you know, if they went to college, if they, are working full-time or anything like that. One of the questions on there is, what did you learn? What do you wish you had learned? Was it beneficial to you? What would you say that needs to be changed? So they get that feedback and now they're out of school, so they're going to tell you exactly what they think. And um, so last year I did it and I had those students that I talked to, they said, you know what? It's making improvements. I think you're trying. Unfortunately, we had, you know, COVID that threw things into it and we couldn't finish everything. And we also talked about how in high school the SNAP program may not have been something that they wanted to do and they liked the Python, but then that was when COVID hit, so we didn't get to explore it as much. And so I made adjustments and I made changes with that. Um, and as far as this year goes, I'm you know, making adjustments, making changes. And I know when I can't, you know, when I talk to the kids, I'm not afraid to say, okay, let me see what I can do to make that better. But as far as what they need when they get out there in the industry, thankfully, I've been talking to my advisory members and saying, what do these kids need? Well, they need to learn how to send an email. Okay, you know what? We spent, you'd be surprised how long it took to learn how to send an email, 
understand what a carbon copy was, and send a calendar invitation. These kids have never sent a calendar invitation. Why would they need to? They know how to program it in their phone, but let's send a calendar invite to somebody. Let's set up a Zoom call. Half of them didn't even have a Zoom account other than the log in to Zoom with their teacher. So we went over some of these skills so that when they get into the career, they're not just, you know, thrown into the wolves. You know, they're learning and um, I think it's a little bit at a time as the as we get through something and I'm ready to tackle something else, my advisory, they're, they're pretty open with me and they will tell me exactly what they think I need to cover. And I even have students on my advisory board. So I have a current student, I have a graduated student, and I think that's huge. So they get to speak up and end of the year reflections from the students asking them what they feel that they need to add to the class. Um, one thing they wanted this year was field trips. I can't give them field trips. Not that I'm not trying, but companies aren't willing to let kids in right now. Um, and so we try to take field trips and do opportunities for them, but I can only do what I'm able to do. <laughs> I see. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. Um, it is like a, a final question on the industry piece. Um, do you ever worry about overfitting for the current requirements or overfitting for industry requirements as opposed to um, giving, um, just because I, I, I do, and I think a lot of people see them as, as competing requirements, like um, the ability to dig into algorithms for months and understand um, different implementations or reason about time complexity of algorithms and stuff that that you know you you would spend like a fair bit of time if you were to go into a cs degree like that that's that is a lot of and you can argue pros and cons there but that's a lot of what people spend and um you know universities are supposed to prepare people for a career um then again you can sort of like argue whether or not they do a good job with that um, or for um you know a, a graduate program um and so I'm really interested to know what you think about overfitting for like today's requirements for, for teaching them something um, like Java, for example, that um, and like, or maybe what, maybe web development is better sort of thing, you know, like teaching for WordPress, but as we all know, you know, there, there's so many different ways to build websites and like that'll change and, and that'll become old school. And so there, there are definitely these two, um, competing arguments, which is, you know, one, one is just teach for what exists today, and then um, they'll be able to sort of figure out, you know, if they're successful with the today's stuff, they'll be able to figure out tomorrow's stuff um, on their own. Yeah, as opposed to teaching for like this, this more general um, dream of what computer science is, and then having them figure out the other stuff on their own. Hmm. I'm not sure I follow everything you're asking, so I'll try and approach it. But one of the things that I keep reminding them is, you know what? I When I went to high school, I took Pascal in high school. I got to college and I was like, what's this Fortran class? Let me take Fortran. Okay, took Fortran. By me taking Fortran, that was putting me off the semester by one um, sorry, that put me off by one semester, and then they started C++. So I've explained to them, look, if I hadn't taken Fortran, then I would have had to take Pascal, and then Pascal would end up being wasted because then it switched to C++. Technology is constantly changing. The idea behind a loop, if you physically, lists, loops, you know, uh, flow charts, that logic exists. How you do it and how you approach it is going to change. Python, Java, by diversifying them, saying, okay, here's block-based, here's, you know, text-based, here's a mixture of two. Python's sloppy, you know, I guess. <laughs> sloppy in one way and not sloppy in another, because if you get a space off, you're screaming at your screen. But um, so and then Java, there's so much diversity. And if a kid ends up 
getting college credit. You know, we offer college credit in high school now. I don't know if you realize that there's a program, um, I think it's called OSEC, and they allow students to earn college credit and, and you know, not have to pay for as many classes. College is not cheap. <laughs> so if we can provide them that opportunity to save money and, you know, the, the benefit of having these college classes and everything like that, um, you know, would be huge. So um, I, I guess overfitting, I, I don't feel like I'm sticking to a mold. I'm giving them an opportunity to see, like, everything's changing. And especially technology, look at your phone. If you look at your phone when you were in elementary school, not that you had a phone, but where's the landlines? You know, who knows what a rotary phone is? Where are you going to find a pay phone? Technology is constantly changing. And if you stick to that, it's always this way, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Your logic is going to work. But you know what? Sometimes your logic, you don't want to get stuck in a rut where it's always this way either. And you need to explore. And I think the idea of pair programming is also beneficial because you can turn and talk to somebody. And I'll tell you, the way they approached it was not the way I would have done it. But that's more efficient. So they're getting an exposure to a lot of things and a lot of diversity, and we're just doing the best we can. <laughs> but if you have something as an advisory member, feel free to speak up and tell me what to do differently. How's that for an answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. I mean, it, it's sort of, um, you know, it, it's, it's um, obviously we need, we need, you know, we, in, in general, like as an education, community need to do as much as we can to make make things even better but i think the fact that you're able to teach this much computer science in high school um is um i don't know i'm looking for the right word <laughs> it's rare um you know to to be able to give people such a broad opportunity i mean i, I wish you know, I, I i sort of went through more of like the um you know, boarding school track and stuff like that and for me these things didn't exist even in that kind of kind of an academic environment and then so to see that um, folks um, within the public school system are able to follow their passion like this uh, regardless whether or not they end up pursuing um, you know like the full four-year you know, full four-year um, higher ed track or you know what whatever their sort of like desired direction I think is really incredible um, and it's something that yeah. I hope more and more schools are able to adopt. And, you know, I think that that's sort of like cradle to career um, fear, maybe, maybe it's overblown. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you, you are able to teach a lot of the standard stuff um, or a lot of the traditional stuff and then just layer on the career things and, and, um, I'm sure your students appreciate the challenge and appreciate the opportunity. Um, and yeah, I had they, an email yeah. today from a, a freshman parent. Um, so this is a ninth grader. He was in my SNAP class last year for, um, you know, in eighth grade. And mom emailed me today and just said, love, love the program. And, you know, he signed up for next year to do the programming and gaming. And he said he wants to be a computer, you know, programmer now and just loves this opportunity. But then on the flip side, I want to add, I have some females that are amazing. They are so quiet in their classes and they come into this world and they are just blossoming. So I love the diversity. I would love to get more girls involved and I'm trying to bridge that gap so that we do have more diversity in this program um, and make it fun. Because if I can get them hooked in the intro class and just explore all the different things, what did we do today? Well, we made an app. You made an app? Yeah. Here, let me pull it up on my phone and show you. Show them how it can be fun. Then they're hooked. Is programming easy? No, it's hard. But you know what? So is riding your bike, but you didn't give that up, and you can ride your bike now. So you just got to keep pushing at it, and if it's something you want to do, you're going to do it. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm sure that, that that's probably a discussion in and of itself, like how to, how to sort of um, build that um, confidence in students and, and, and also the diversity question. I mean, my gut feeling is that it's, it's probably even, even more exacerbated in a CT program where, it, where people are associating computer science with a programming career. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that, <laughs> as opposed to computer science purely as an academic topic. Um, uh, yeah, well, you can get, um, depending on your path, you can actually get your math credit in computer science if, you're, if you talk to the high school counselors. There are programs, like some of the CTE classes, like finance, can count as your senior year math credit. And I don't have the chart memorized, but there's several other things that could be. Um, you know, so it that's an advantage. And sometimes some kids take those classes because I don't want to take math my senior year. Let me take this. And then they're like, wow, this is kind of fun. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of options out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a closing question, I'm, I'm personally interested in uh, what uh, what parents think about this. What I mean, do, do parents see programming as a, a a real career? Like, I mean, I honestly have no idea what what's sort of in the in the parental K twelve parent zeitgeist in twenty twenty one. Well, um, I will tell you, this will kind of go into our career focused, you know, director, Lisa, has started this program in the elementary schools. She will go and show the kids every um, career path starting at, you know, kindergarten, I think is what they started with. Even if it's playing dolls and understanding what's going on, she actually coordinated the STEM I um, system that came into the parking lot at the middle school today and gave the kids some hands-on experience with robotics and stuff like that and I saw fourth graders and they're just having a blast with computer science and um, learning how to program some basic things so it's in the works this woman is like I said you should have her on she would have a million things for you and talk about but um, it is in the plan so as far as parents go though um, when I started my advisory board last year in October was my first meeting. I had maybe about, I don't know, four or five parents that were involved. My list of parents that are supportive and willing to help me has grown. I mean, it has just blossomed. They're excited. Um, even if their kid doesn't want to do computer science, they're learning skills that is going to carry over with them in life. Maybe it's not, um, maybe they don't want to be a programmer, but you know what? They learn some logic. And what do you mean you don't know how to solve a problem? Wait, you got to talk it through? Yeah, I talk through the program and I don't have to bother somebody next to me. You know, even that simple of talking to your rubber duck, you, just, you saw where I was going with this, but even talking to that rubber duck and understanding how to problem solve is huge. And the parents from everybody I've talked to, they love this program and they love to see that their kids are in an, where they can grow. And um, this program building is huge for them. I mean, they wouldn't have, the kids wouldn't have signed up and their kids are excited. They're coming home and they're sharing stories. And some of these kids are actually talking to their parents and telling them what they did at school, which if you have children, you know that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so. Yeah, for sure. No, oh, that's awesome. I think it's really exciting to see all this happening um, in high school. Um, so with that, we're, we're coming up on time here, and I'm, I don't want to take any more of your uh, evening today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave people with? Um, just if you're interested in the CTE realm, don't Google it. You're not going to find the answers. Uh, you're going to get confused, and you're going to lost. I would get lost. Um, I would talk to the director at your school and if your school doesn't have one, I would reach out and you can even contact the state and find out more information about that. But then also, if you are in the computer science industry, reach out to the schools and offer your help. Um, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent just trying to recruit people and you may not think somebody has an interest for your field, but maybe they don't know it exists and they just need to be that, you know, educated. So that's what I think. Awesome. 
That sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kim. And I look forward to next Coding Rooms podcast. With that, thank you all. Thanks, and have a great evening. All right. Thank you. All right.